good afternoon. Um, I know from my little academic uh, experience how great it is to deliver the speech to the group right after lunch. Uh, <laughs> very, very, very eager. Uh, I've been asked to host this event which will be limited actually to three things. The first which I should say at the very end, but I will say it at the very beginning. After this meeting, everyone is invited to move on the other side of the street to the Arta again for a coffee and the keynote in the evening. This is the first. The second and most important, I would like to um, welcome uh, Igor Stix, um, a politics researcher from the University of Belgrade, uh, among many other things. Um, and then the third, uh, as I understand, my hosting position should be here limited to stop Igor when he's, uh, he will start preaching us too much <laughs> and also encourage you guys if you will not uh, be willing to jump into the discussion uh, after Igor's presentation. Uh, but I think I don't need uh, neither of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you all. Um, I'll see if I'll be using this chair um, and um, uh, I'll s um, my role here is to present you some of my work that corresponds quite well with the, with the Reshape project. It's on art and citizenship and social movements and protest movements or how art becomes part of, of, uh, of say, activism or activist citizenship. It is also not only about art. This is why it's called activist aesthetics. We could discuss this theoretically if you want. What does it mean? Um, you all know from your experience that protest or certain public action always have certain type of aesthetics. But uh, generally speaking, I will concentrate on certain artistic forms, uh, art, but also art understood quite largely, um, uh, within these movements, within what is happening over the last 10 years, in the post-Yugoslav space. So this is the regional limitation. I will be speaking about this space and the last last 10 years. Why I'm speaking about last 10 years, it is the period when we faced, when we faced, when we experienced uh, something unusual for the post-socialist countries, which is the rebirth of the left. Uh, the rebirth of the left. And uh, especially our friends from Eastern Europe, I think it will be an interesting uh, um, point of comparison to see what's happening in their countries and why in certain countries it's easier to reanimate uh, um, some tenets of socialist ideology and why it's not possible in other places. Or why the post-Yugoslav space correspond more with what's happening in, in, in mostly uh, uh, capitalist West when it comes to the left and not so much with the Eastern Europe. Of course, need, needless to say, you all know that the historical experience of Yugoslavia has been different, and that historical experience will play a role. It's a surprising role. It's a surprising rebirth of the left. When I say rebirth of the left, I'm thinking about modern 21st century left that is equally critical of capitalism as a system, as an unequal system, but also of liberal democratic model as non-representative. Um, and uh, so th this is the left that wants to see alternatives to capitalism and wants to see alternative democratic models. And I'll show you the examples and you'll see uh, what they have in mind. This had a huge echo among artists, a huge echo among cultural workers, and also resulted in a number of series of what we would call cultural artistic products, such as films, such as books, such as... Uh, uh, contemporary art, uh, such as performances, such as theater. I'll try to show as much as I can. It's a sample. It's not exhaustive uh, um, overview of what was going on. Uh, uh, and uh, it will be interesting to, to, to hear your responses. So I, would, I wouldn't go for an hour. I would go maybe for 30, 40 minutes. And then, uh, of course, it will be interesting to hear, to hear the questions. And I'm sure that the discussion will, will enrich uh, uh, or, or I'll be able through discussion to explain certain parts or you yourself will react to the material presented. Um, now, how I approach this issue <laughs> like this. Uh, <laughs> magic, 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 magic. <laughs> 
Sometimes magical thinking doesn't work. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. We will keep it like this. It's been behaving in a strange way. Um, uh, I, want, I, I did a lot of work on citizenship. Um, so I published a book on 100 years of citizenship in the former Yugoslav Yugoslavia and the post-Yugoslav states. I work a lot on, from a legal, political perspective. What does it happen when countries change and they change how they define what citizen is and who can be citizen? I'm sure people here in Cluj know a lot about this, about moving borders, minorities, uh, majorities, about a lot of bad historical experiences, and we live it, as you know, in the uh, space that used to be Yugoslavia, we live it multiple times. And that provided a good, good case study to understand what citizenship is in under the changing regimes. Uh, at that point, when I was uh, finishing my PhD thesis, uh, on this topic, something important happened for, for some people who are now here in, in the room. At least it was import, ex extremely important for me. There was a, something you might call a minor incident, but it's been called the student occupation of the University of Zagreb. Yeah? And I happened to be there waiting for my UK visa going to work in, in Edinburgh. I happened just to be in Zagreb at that point, and I went to join uh, the students to see what is really going on and it turned out to be of utmost importance for the rebirth of the left. Um, it wasn't just another student occupation or student protest, it was a student occupation to fight for free education yeah, against the commercialization of higher education, but two important things happened. It was how it was done uh, uh, that mattered. So one thing is to occupy university, you close the university, it's a student strike, it happens everywhere. But then there was something very important that the students started some sort of an assembly, yeah? citizens assembly, or the plenum as they call it, the plenary assembly. That's also not that unusual, it happens all the time. What was unusual was to invite outsiders to join them. And it turned out into a, an agora of every night of around 1,000 citizens who started discussing issues that are not only related to the university, such as why it happened that we have commercialized higher education, why everything is privatized, or, or why we are living under neoliberal norms. So the whole process started through the, through the form of horizontal democracy. Yeah? And the critique of the system developed quite powerfully of that spot there in April 2009. And then it spread around, and I'll show you how it spread. And that uh, had a huge influence on me. I started working more on, on these movements, on the protest movements, on the leftist movements in the Balkans that were after the, uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, starting suddenly to appear in the public sphere, especially in the media sphere. It was possible again to say, well, maybe capitalism is not the best of all systems. It was possible again to say, well, let's see what we had before. Mm -hmm. So there was this kind of a, 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 a new push in the among the academics, among activists or, or journalists or writers and so on, uh, to talk about alternative models. And that corresponded well, of course, as you know, with the movements that were happening anywhere else, Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, Puerta del Sol, uh, Indignados, and so on. It just happened that somehow there was this synchronicity that in Eastern Europe, in this space of the former Yugoslavia, similar movements were also developing. We'll come again to the, to, this was the rise, and then there was stagnation, and then fall. And we'll come to that maybe in the discussion. Where are we right now, after this glorious decade? Uh, but of course, academically, how I'm going down to, 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 to approach these issues. So I found the solution, and this is I'm now I'm going to the heart of the matter, uh, in um, Hans Thies Lehmann, maybe some of you know, of course, post-dramatic theater and so on, uh, short lecture, half an hour, he was talking about aesthetics of resistance and aesthetics of rebellion in new movements. Uh, Funny enough, you can find the YouTube lecture and then his text, curiously, 
was published in Croatia, in German and in Croatian translation. There was some kind of a obvious correspondence with, with the questions we asked at that time. And what he, what he is proposing with this uh, uh, concept of aesthetics of resistance, aesthetics of rebellion, of course, he, go, uh, he, def he took aesthetics from re of resistance from Peter Weiss, his novel, Aesthetics of Resistance, which is a huge novel. Uh, uh, hopefully, some people will manage to read at least part of it. It's beautifully written. But it speaks about the resistance of German workers, German anti-fascist workers under the Nazi regime. So the idea Le Lehmann gets out of that is that this is a, a work of art that is trying to, to understand the potentialities of, of historical struggles. Also in the novel, <coughs> there's a lot of discussion about how art presents uh, the history. And uh, what were the past resistances? What can we learn from them? What were the potentialities of that moment that didn't happen or happened in a different way? So exploration of, 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 of this becomes for him aesthetics of resistance. Aesthetics of rebellion, on the other hand, for him, is the works of art that are in the moment, that are part of the movement, that are part of political action, that want to support political action, but also, and this is an important point, to articulate that political action. And we all know here that art has this capacity sometimes to give you words or images to express what you actually want to achieve politically. Now, uh, I have a couple of additions to, 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 to what, what Lehmann suggested. Uh, and I'll show you on the, the examples. One is that sometimes we could find the works of art, and I'll show some examples, that do combine aesthetics of both resistance and rebellion, huh? that do reflect on what happened before, but are in the service of the new movement. Second thing is <coughs> what happens with what I would call here aestheticization of resistances, of past resistances. Where is this Che Guevara social club, no? <laughs> typical, typical thing, Che Guevara t-shirt, and so on. Uh, when we were hosting Che Guevara's daughter, Adela Guevara, in Zagreb at Subversi Film Festival, she was so furious because uh, she's she was constantly finding the images or image of her, her father everywhere, but then ended up on panties. Yeah? And then she was like, this is the end of it, absolutely, uh, and the, the most horrible thing that could happen. So this is an, a bit of an aestheticization of past resistances, something we find glorious, something that's cool to have on your t-shirt, something that, that is maybe just a fashion night. But of course, here comes the, here comes the, the difference that in a various contexts, this same Che Guevara shirt will clearly put a different me uh, message. If it's a swimming pool party at Hotel Belvedere with Che Guevara t-shirt, all right, yeah. But if it's in a protest, and it depends on what kind of protest movement, Che Guevara's image will get another meaning. So I think we have to kind of keep this as well in mind. And the question is how you move from aestheticization to resistance. How something that is maybe just there for a consumer consumption uh, becomes, cultural consumption, becomes actually subversive or becomes part of, 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 of resistance. Uh, here are also our friends. We have this uh, who did something very interesting, which is actually to set up choirs. Yeah? Uh, and in former Yugoslavia, we have this whole phenomenon of choirs who are singing revolutionary songs. I think there are 10 of them. Even one outpost in Vienna of the former Yugoslavs getting together and singing songs, songs from socialist period. It, it is a true phenomenon. And at first, when people show up, it was so funny to hear again these songs that you somehow remember. Uh, there was always a bit of ironic distance, a bit of smile when you mentioned socialism and when you sing partisan songs. But that was 10 years ago, seven or eight years. And then suddenly this has become more important. So that many choirs joined the movement and were singing at the protest. And there was no irony there whatsoever. Some of our friends went, um, were, ended up <laughs> arrested because they were singing partisan songs 
at the Kozera uh, uh, monument, which is a monument to the, to the partisans themselves, but they've been completely captured by nationalist uh, forces in that part of Bosnia. So they came there to sing partisan songs in honor of the partisan because the mo monument is in honor of the partisans who died for freedom and they were arrested by police. Which song was it? Uh, I don't know, a couple of them, but related to that, that area. So you, then it became quite serious that even singing these songs in public uh, of, uh, uh, could get you in, in, in jail. And of course, to, to, to oppose these songs to the nationalist anthems that were sang there. Um, so this is how we could see this movement, how we could recapture symbols uh, for the, the existing, existing movements. And of course, the question I'm asking, is this something like call it aesthetics of emancipation? And how to understand it will come to the conclusion. I don't have an answer, but maybe we'll come to this answer. But I'll go now to, to the examples, just to illustrate what, what I just said, and to talk first about the aesthetics of resistance. So what you are, what you are seeing here uh, is, a, is a theater performance in Belgrade, entirely based on partisan, early socialist, revolutionary poems. Um, 45 minutes, 50 minutes of reciting these heroic verses, usually from the 30s, from the 40s, then uh, the verses uh, written during the socialist reconstruction after the Second World War and so on. What was curious about that? I recited these same, spo same poems when I was a child in Sarajevo in elementary school. I knew them by heart. Yeah? We would come and then we would say, oh, and then he died for the comes in, blah, 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 blah. And our parents would come there and everyone was like, mm, okay, and another school show, and that's it. We couldn't understand it at the end of 80s. We couldn't understand any of that. It was just an empty ritual. Yeah, of a dying system. <coughs> when we heard that in 2000, and when, what was it, 2014, <coughs> like everyone was silenced, in, silent in the audience. <coughs> Curiously enough, one, one woman who was sitting next to me, she is famous in Belgrade as a liberal, anti-communist, very liberal. She was sitting there and she said, hmm, what used to be a regime, now it's a subversion. You know, sometimes liberals could get to the point. She said it directly next to me. I said, yes. Uh, this is a mural painted by a course collective in Belgrade. And uh, you would ask yourself, why someone needs to paint the mural about the liberation of Belgrade in 1944 today? Uh, the reason is, of course, that this anti-fascist heritage been sidelined or marginalized, or questioned, that what we consider as a liberation for some right-wing conservative forces uh, was yet another occupation or the beginning of the communist, communist dictatorship and so on and so on. So the, the Kurs Collective decided to put this mural on, on a building in Belgrade celebrating this, this event uh, by, by showing what kind of momentous uh, event that was when Belgrade was liberated from the Nazi occupation. They did another thing as well, again, uh, uh, in Belgrade, it is called Struggle Knowledge Equality. What you see here is their take on a student magazine from 1934. And uh, 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 it, is, it is their take to understand the student struggles in 1934 were exactly the same as today. They were also protesting against uh, uh, the fact that not everyone could study, they were protesting for more democracy, they were also radical and so on. So the course collective went back a bit in history to understand what was that struggle then and how actually we could connect with it. Um, then you will see something that some of you might know, Igor Grubic, Croatian artist, uh, did something simple. He put the red uh, red scar on monuments dedicated to heroes of anti-fascist struggles huh? and of communist revolution, of course. So it's, now you can see how, how it actually looks like. I'm trying to see. Uh -huh. 
All right. So see, see this classical monument to a hero of revolutionary struggle. Now when he has the red scarf, he looks like one of us, kind of like San Zapatista, like someone who is contemporary. And that was, of course, intended. Yeah? Mm. That there is, a, there is a sense of kind of trying to get back to the ideals that used to be official, as I'm, I'm referring here to Badiou, who contrasted the official art with militant art. Almost, almost as if, you know, like he would say official art is the art of the result of what has been victoriously decided. Okay, we won it and then we build monuments to it, like we did in Yugoslavia. But the militant art is an art of the contradiction between affirmative nature of principles and the du dubious results of struggle. The principles are clear, huh? they are affirmative. We want better society, we want paradise on earth. But the dubious results of struggles, as you know, are quite, quite, quite complex and not always according to the script. But this is what he would call militant art. It comes very well to explain what I'm, what I'm saying here. How we came to the situation that the former official art, officially sanctioned art, officially sponsored art, meaning socialist art, could become a militant art today. And there is an entire movement of kind of uh, saving the, the, the socialist monuments from decay, from destruction. Um, in the 90s, most of these monuments were bombed and dynamited and destroyed. Uh, this especially happened in Croatia during the war. And uh, now people are trying to save them, but also to understand what was their meaning. So again, the same situation. What used to be a regime is suddenly becoming radical. Radical again. Huh? You, we are getting the, 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 the story behind the fact that so many people died to defeat Nazism, that so many people died to bet for a better society, that people invested so much energy into this modernizing socialist project that was Yugoslav self-management. Now, here is an example of what I mentioned when the aesthetics of resistance comes together with the aesthetics of rebellion. Uh, during 2014, now you remember this, I mentioned the plenums and the horizontal democracy of Zagreb students 2009. It exploded in Bosnia, of all places, in 2014 with protest movement that is quite similar to what is happening today in Lebanon. So in a divided country, when there is no public space, when you can't enter official institutions without being labeled as Serb, Croat or Bosniak, uh, people just came on the street, they burned the, the, the government building in Tuzla, then they did the same thing in Sarajevo and in other places, and in a matter of days, some 20 regional governments resigned. Um, there was a moment that something is happening it was an ethnic movement. It, did, it was a movement that was calling for social justice. Huh? Social justice, just that. And that surprised everyone. International observers, international aid workers, uh, politicians were frightened for a couple of days. Then they figure out that it will pass. And that uh, we probably, and I say we, I say because I also participate in that, we're not that powerful, that we are not going to go a step further. One thing we did remains contra cont controversial. We basically invited people to the plenums, to citizens' assemblies, instead of streets. Even today, I meet some people who, who tell me, you tricked us. We should have continued burning things. <laughs> if you burn, they see you. If you go somewhere and discuss, and discuss, and discuss, nobody cares. They might be right. I'm not going to say it openly, <laughs> but there's something there. Uh, and this was a, a, a two Sarajevo, Sarajevo artists did this little poster. Now, now I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, why it's, it connects directly to this, to this monument in Cyrillic, which was a monument to Gavrilo Princip. Everybody know here Gavrilo Princip, the guy who, who killed Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, yeah? First World War. And this was an interesting monument in 1949 
1949, just keep it in mind, where socialist art is, you know, socialist realism and so on, it's a uh, Sarajevo artist was commissioned to make a monument to Gavrilo Prince. So what he did was, as we say now, conceptual art before conceptual art. He just put his footsteps onto the concrete and put it on the pavement. And with this little inscription that says, from this place on 28th of June, 1914, Gavrilo Princip, with his gunshot, expressed, so he didn't kill anyone, he expressed, he expressed the people's protest against tyranny and centuries of desire of our peoples for freedom. And that was it. That was the entire monument. So as a kid, we would all stand in these footsteps, yeah? People were coming and saying, there's two footsteps there. Then the war happened. And then you see what happens with, with historical heroes. So, Gavrilo Princip died in Theresienstadt in 1918. He didn't live to see Yugoslavia. Uh, and in Yugoslavia, he was greeted as hero, yeah? who literally killed the oppressor. Um, in socialist Yugoslavia, socialist communists had a bit of a problem with that, but wanted to include his legacy into the new narrative. Huh? And this was the way to include Gavrilo Princip into the new narrative. Gavrilo Princip did it for all of us. Yeah? He wasn't just some kind of Serb terrorist. He wanted to fight for the freedom of all our peoples. The war starts, you have Sarajevo besieged, you have Serb extremists on the, on the mountain tops claiming that Gavron Princip indeed was only Serb and nothing but a Serb who was fighting for the freedom only of one people, Serb people. The response of those who stay in the city was to dig his footsteps and throw them into the nearby river and start saying Gavron Princip was what? A Serb terrorist who destroyed the beautiful Austria, Austria-Hungary uh, that uh, w was so much multicultural and so on. So different interpretations, obviously. Until 2014, and when uh, 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 this, this uh, poster was done, again footsteps, and it says what? From this place on the 7th of February 2014, an anonymous person with a thro thrown stone express the people's protest against tyranny and centuries old desire of our people for freedom. This was an interesting new leftist reappropriation of Prince. Yeah? And a month later there was a centenary of the First World War and some of, of, of our comrades went there and did another performance, I don't have a photo, when they put the faces of Prince on their face, <coughs> saying we are again you know, we are again occupied and we are again going to rebel. So it's an interesting way, way how to deal with the past. But here clearly you see that the reference is directly to the official art. Yeah? And how you can reappropriate that a new context to become a militant art. Another example, very close to my heart, that I pick it up for my, for my book on citizenship, is this, uh, another work by Igor Grubic. This, what you can see, is the Faculty of Philosophy in Zagreb, where the rebellion I told you about started in 2009, occupation. Yeah? So Igor went there as a true artist, looking around, figure out that there is a monument next to it that most of us didn't know what it was. And he pulled these red, thin red threads, yeah? thin red threads between the building and that monument. Bear in mind, at that point, many people, including myself, did not give a leftist spin to what was happening. It was clear that this is something progressive and so on, but no one was entirely sure what's going on. Somehow, with this color, red, and with these threads getting to, the, to this monument, Igor was on the right track. Although he said in his book, that color, the ch uh, choice of color has nothing to do with ideo the ideology. <laughs> All right. What is that monument? Again, a monument from the 60s to a poet, 
to a poet, 19th century poet, who was similarly to Princip against Austrian rule, yeah, for the freedom of South Slavs. Uh, and the, it was done as a, as a of course, five-point yeah, star. Like that's an interesting thing, although that man wasn't communist, wasn't even so, had some socialist ideas at the end of 19th century, but wasn't communist. But it was a way how official art tried to recuperate the heroes from the past into the, into the new narrative. But interestingly enough, uh, what Igor Grubic did, put this red thread to the monuments, and then did a little tag below the monument with the verses from the same point, which says, you will die that day when you betray the ideals of your youth. Nice. <laughs> nice message to students and so on, to all of us. So interesting way how he managed to actually capture this kind of res resistance part, that history that was somewhere, that now is suddenly coming to life with the new rebellion. The artist himself who did this monument, as many artists, is now doing big crosses. Everything is about Jesus. So the guys who was getting a lot of money has been producing official socialist art, figure out that the times have changed. And the money is now somewhere else. So you see, some people indeed betrayed the ideals of their youth if they ever had any youth. Again, the Kurs Collective doing now a bit more of a direct action. Going to a factory in uh, North Croatia that was occupied by workers. In a similar thing like in Argentina, occupy, resist, produce. So they occupied because the boss, of course, destroyed the factory in, in, in debt. The factory was a huge debt. They were all licensed. So they pretty much said, we are taking it over. They took it over, organized a new production in a self-managed way, and they're still working. So the Kurs Collective guys from Belgrade <coughs> went to Croatia to, to do this mural in honor of the workers. And what does the mural says? It says, Factories to the workers. The old, old slogan. Factories to the workers, here they are with the workers of that, of that factory. So this is clearly the step into the, into the struggle with a direct reference to self-management as a system of workers' ownership that we had in Yugoslavia. With all its fault and all successes that need to be said, this is a system we had that was based on the idea that workers own their factories. Now, going directly into the protest over the last years, many people in Zagreb will remember this, although now it's almost 10 years, oh my god. Uh, typical protest against the devastation of urban environment. What does it mean? I think people in Romania would also understand it everywhere else is that the private interests are taking over public interests in capturing the space of the city, turning them into real estate, and so on and so on. You know how it goes, how the story goes. So this is a street in Zagreb that used to be pedestrian, but for the development of a nearby real estate um, uh, project, uh, they, they needed a garage for their luxury car, so they took half of the street for their garage, and that's how it goes. But there were huge spark was that kind of fighting the corruption and fighting for the commons on behalf of the right to the city movement. Many of you would know that sounds or that David Harris building on the favor, the right to the city movement developed in many places in the West, but also in Zagreb and later on in Belgrade, as I will show. So what you see here is an artistic performance was called Burial of the Public Interest in that garage. So they throw the coffin, here is the coffin with the flag of the city of Zagreb, and sadly, the public interest died and was thrown there in the parking. Another curious example was this Trojan horse. Trojan horse. What was the message of this Trojan horse? Was that this is only beginning. This is a Trojan horse. This project is only a Trojan horse of the hugely corrupted scheme to take over public sources, urban resources, and so on. It's a bit abstract. I mean, in a way, you, you want to have a 
clear things. But they built this nice Trojan horse. And curiously enough, police understood the thing, or people who <laughs> immediately destroyed it. Why do you need to destroy it? You need there, who cares? They immediately destroyed it. Then there was an interesting action on behalf of the city, corrupt city mayor of the city of Zagreb, who is still mayor of the city of Zagreb, of course. You get this for life. <laughs> they built flowery horse. Flowery horse. As opposed to Trojan horse, they built flowery horse. And then they put a little mailbox there for the suggestions of citizens. Because we are all for participation, aren't we? Yeah, we all that. Brilliant idea. That's how it ended. People understood it. Fire bombing. And it happened like some four times. The city was building and then bombing, bombing, bombing and so on. But that's how sometimes you know, discussion stops and you have to use some of the fire. And this is the Don't Draw Belgrade, a similar movement that developed in Belgrade, uh, also called from the organization, also called the Right to the City. Surprising, unsurprisingly, all these people are, people are friends. No? Zagreb, Belgrade, don't get into the idea that those are different countries and so on. Maybe they are. But they all hang out together, go to the <laughs> seaside together, exchange ideas. And then, of course, in Belgrade, there is an even bigger project called Belgrade Waterfront, people from Lebanon would know what is about. Solitaire was mentioned yesterday. It is exactly the same scheme. Captured a large chunk of the city territory, build from build, uh, bring bogus investor from Emirati to build luxury apartments there, and so on and so on. And it's still going on. The protest movement didn't make a thing. Now, if there was a Trojan horse there, here is a duck. That became a symbol. Why? Because the movement's called Don Drone Belgrade, Belgrade Waterfront on the riverbank of Sava. And the duck, this rubber duck, became a symbol of the movement of opposition. That, of course, didn't do only aesthetic things. There were huge protests, as you can see on the streets of Belgrade, against this. What is this bong? Uh, uh, for. Ah, for freedom. For freedom, yeah or uh, 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 because of the things. Mm -hmm. And the problem, of course, with all of this, that those were big, massive movements that couldn't stop what is happening. Yeah? Uh, very often, they would do these playful things. Anyone who is interested in social movements or participate in them knows that there is this carna carnivalesque thing about sometimes social movements. And, and it is very important that through the play, through carnival, through street theaters, through through artistic interventions, you are giving a, a, a dynamic to the movement. Uh, one of these was the so-called Duck Mobile. And they <coughs> used the Duck Mobile and going around the city uh, because they wanted to move their struggle from the streets to the elections. Using the example of their friends in Zagreb who managed to get elected into the city parliament. And again, they were using a lot of these aesthetic aesthetic kind of uh, interventions in order to mobilize people. They failed to mobilize people. They failed to enter the, the city city assembly. And now they are, they, they are plotting their next move in a way how to organize better. But it's been going on already for 10 years. So it's a story of resistance and resilience, but also a bitter story that you can, that you can see your city transform regardless of the wishes of, of people who live there, regardless of practice movement that there is not much you can do. Now, this is an example, again, I'm going to show of uh, cultural workers in Croatia who organized under the name of Kulturnyaci, uh, people who do culture. Uh, in 2016, the immediate motive was uh, the right-wing, very right-wing government coming into power in Croatia in 2016 and nominated openly neo-Nazi uh, person as cultural minister. Of course, that's what you do. So what that neo-Nazi person did was, of course, something that we are, we are afraid to do. He immediately cut funds for all progressive and, and leftist organizations, kick out people from their ministry in a matter of days. And before we understood anything, they were just taking control over the, the entire space. The left would never do this because it's afraid of having the right-wing demonstrations. The left would keep on giving money to 
to extremist organizations and their things and never dare to do things. Of course, this guy did it because he has an agenda. But the resistance also happened. People finally understood, oh my God, we have to do something. So they organized and this was one of their performances uh, called the, the Eclipsed Sun. So what they did, this is a sculpture in the center of Belgrade by a famous Croatian sculptor called the, 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 the Sun on Earth or the Sun, the Earth is Sun. And they basically bring this black cloth and did this the Eclipse Sun as their kind of a performance saying this is the end of it, this is the darkest period we are getting. Now I'm, I'll get back to this occupation in 2009 in order to, to show you a bit the atmosphere and what it was all about. And uh, here you see, see some of the picture, classical picture of citizens' assembly of the plenums. Uh, it resulted in a documentary, very important, actually in two documentaries uh, called uh, Blockade, Blockada. And the uh, interesting thing is, and I'm keeping, of course, on the track not to, to, to only talk about the events, but also of artistic response to it, that so many people going around with cameras, um, uh, basically um, documenting the struggle. So that's the aesthetics of resistance as it happens. Of course, then there is editing process you, you do after that, and we got an extraordinary, extraordinary documentary. I will sh show you a trailer if you are okay with it simply to get a bit of atmosphere so that what I'm saying will not sound too dry and uh, for me to, to get a bit of water. But how do we, how do we do that? Control T. Control T. It should uh, or your phone. Ah. So you said that, ah, uh -huh, uh -huh. Cannot locate the internet as a single person. Oh my god, now I don't have internet. No, there is no internet. There's a. Aha, uh -huh, you give me internet and I'll continue talking about, about, about this. Uh, <coughs> and also getting into the, 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 the problems related to, um, to this wonderful thing, such as people coming together and actually making decisions. Surprisingly, the movement was very effective in doing this. Usually they will tell you, no, this cannot work because there are too many people and, and direct democracy does not work anyhow. In many cases, this is the case, that, that happens. In this case, it did work. Maybe it worked because those were students who anyhow, you know, spend their time there and also many other citizens were coming who shared the beliefs, but there was a, there was a sense of responsibility in discussing. And of course, the sense of what I would later on call aesthetics of emancipation. These, these e events are usually very personal, very theatrical. You feel you are part of something else. Yeah? You know, uh, the, uh -huh. oh, that's great. And now you'll see, you'll see a bit of it, at least one minute. It's a long tra trailer, four minutes, but at least let's see how it goes. Now 
svojim ciljem, što želite, što to znači borit se protiv komercijalizacije? Ajmo to malo konkretno, što to znači? I zato treba reći ne tehnicizaciji i birokratizaciji studiranja. Treba reći ne pretvaranju fakulteta i sveučilišta u tvorničke pogone za proizvodnju tzv. znanja i treba reći ne pretvaranju profesora u pogonske radnike, a studenta u sirovi. I ono drugo što moram reći kad vas vidim, živi o filozofski fakultet. Ja smatram da vječe treba podržati metodu kojom je ova akcija provedena, jer su te metode bile nužne, primjerene postavljene cilje. atmosphere here. Uh, one has to say something that this happened in 2009 and again it speaks to uh, porosity of a newly imposed borders in the post-Yugoslav space that this was inspired by a failed occupation of Belgrade University in 2006. It was smaller, not much media attention, but had a similar, similar form, which is an assembly, yeah? the plenary form. And their Zagreb colleagues heard about it, read about it, and perfected the method that will result in this. Now let us see what happens when artists occupy, when artists decide to occupy certain spaces. Maybe this will be very useful for reshape. This is the occupation of a cinema called Zvezda, the star, in the center of Belgrade. Uh, the background, of course, some of you might know, is a series of occupations, especially in Italy, of cultural venues, Teatro Vale, and so on. A lot of cinemas occupied and run by artists on inclusive basis. After all, Teatro Vale movement was the beginning of the movement for the urban commons in Italy and developed the whole strategy from that point on. Uh, the cinema uh, Zvezda uh, 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 was destroyed or closed down uh, with a classical corrupt scheme, which went like this. You simply say that these, these cinematographers are not, not profitable enough. You s sell them to some shady businessmen who, of course, bought 14 prime time real estate assets for next to nothing, licensed the people who work there, and then speculated with it on the market. What happened is that that businessman also failed and uh, was in bankruptcy. So this is how Belgrade lost its cinemas. And this is how these buildings uh, went into, into uh, continuous decay. Until one day, some film people, some directors, some actors, together with people from the right to the city movement, decided to enter into the building, to <coughs> occupy, to clean it, to open it up, to start running the program, program again. And the movement was met with a lot of enthusiasm. Immediately people jumped and like, like in Zagreb with the, with the faculty, they were going every day there, participating in discussion, a lot of things were happening, many important people showed up, uh, including the former Prime Minister of Greece, Tsipras. So there was a there was a big event around him. Michel Gondry did a film dedicated to the cinema of Zvezda. New York Times was writing about it. The situation, of course, was far from rosy, and you will see this in this trailer. Another very interesting documentary called Occupied Cinema was produced in 2018. And you'll see the trailer. No, this cannot be true. Uh, okay, so here it is. Ovo je 
pokroj sve, ne smije se pavlje. Sud je dokazao da je oštetio državu i bivše zaposlene. Kome od nas ovo mogao pasti na pamet da će nas u stvari država da opljačka? Imali smo fokus da uđemo, ali smo ostavili tu priču šta treba da bude ovde za kasnije. Mislim da je bitno da onaj ko je tu 24 sata ima pravo da priča prvo. Ne možemo da pojmo ko je izdo ovo ovo, ali možemo, možemo. To što pričaš je ono, korijen propasti ovo. To umorit ćemo se, dakle ovaj tip razgovara može da se vodi i ono, neđu dana, dve nedelje, mesec dana, ali dakle nam treba da treba prostandar za priliv, nove energije i da ne. Pozdrav iz okupiranog bioskopa. Koliko para tražite za bioskop? Čije je bio? Šeka i gleda pitanje. Ovo je sindikalna stvar filmskih radnika koji nemaju ide da puštaju i prave filmove. So in this short trailer, basically you saw the problems that arise once you occupy the place. It's even, it's very easy to occupy the place. Maybe it's not that easy, but sometimes you, you're inside, you have to decide what you're gonna do out of that. What is the meaning of what you did? And clearly two groups uh, went into conflict uh, that will uh, eventually lead to the marginalization of the movement and also uh, to its depoliticization. One group was presented by filmmakers who believed as they say, who, ac who actually is here 24 hours has the right to speak first, yeah? And the other people believe that what is being occupied, it's not only cinema, it's not about only film workers and their films. It's also about commons. It's also about urban commons. It's also about the struggle against neoliberalism and so on. This is <coughs> why Alain Badiou was there, as I mentioned. You saw Tsipras and some other famous people who were showing up for a month, and after that, people figure out that this is not going to be a very radical experiment. Many people within the movement rejected labels, especially the label of the left, and wanted to talk with the state directly so that the state gives more money for the filmmaking. This is a good lesson about what, what actually might happen and how you want to how you wanna run your struggle. Now, and I'll finish in a couple of minutes. <coughs> Uh, now, this question of emancipation. This is the Sarajevo Plenum for 2014, so not art artists, not only students, but actually citizens from all walks of life. Even a more difficult thing to manage, especially if you have a horizontal principle of horizontality, especially if you are talking about society that has been traumatized by war and the post-war, and when people got, for the first time, the right to speak. It was an enormous success uh, for, um, for a month. Everyone was writing about it, everyone was totally thrilled about it, that people are taking hands, taking matters into their own hands, that the true democracy comes for people that does not want to be divided anymore, and that cry for social justice. Again, the question, this is the Tuzla plenum, and there was many of these plenums, and it indeed was a beautiful sight, the problem is that you can't occupy forever. You cannot come every day to make getting in, into a very difficult decision-making process that doesn't lead anywhere. Protests, movement come and go. Um, you also have to have a wider strategy, which is very difficult when you get so many different, different actors. What happened is, of course, this kind of aesthetics of being together. Yeah? And then talking about, you know, thinking about Ranciere, it's an experience of something, of an order that is different, of a different distribution of the sensible, is, as he was saying, his aesthetics of politics. The, the, the things could be said differently, understood differently. And this, of course, <coughs> is beautiful. One of the last examples of this we have from Skopje, Macedonia, so to see that that the entire region is covered by this movement. I forgot to mention Slovenian uprising in 2012 or 2013. Not enough space for, for all of this. Uh, but this happened in Skopje when again, 
the, 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 the university was occupied and the plenum was established. And you can see there is a free university and said autonomous zone. So the direct reference is to autonomous zones. The question, everyone would say that this does, this changes you. Huh? This changes your perception of the world. We create a spaces for prefigurative politics, for politics that is yet to come. Spaces for a different experience of doing anything together. And this is, I would say, claim some kind of aesthetics of, of, of emancipation, where you can feel a taste of emancipation, at least for a, for a little bit, at least for a limited period of time within the limited space. That would be a positive assessment of all these movements. Not only these movements of Occupy Wall Street, of our other protest movements, everywhere. Slightly less optimistic assessment would be that these movements cannot challenge power, that they, not, they can't change the power relations, that the system calculates you already, that calculates your place within the whole story, that you'll always have a place for these kind of things. There is a cooptation mechanisms that are very, very powerful, and they've been tested, especially in the Netherlands or Denmark and other places, where finally if someone occupies some building, then just legalize the squad, co-op them into the whole story, turn it into a uh, gentrification success story. Doesn't matter. There are ways to do things. So you got, you, you got between radicality, almost insurrectional mo mo uh, moment, towards cooptation and neutralization of these experiences. And then it's business as usual, it's politics as usual. Maybe our role as artists, as activists, or combination of, of this, as thinkers, as people, as writers, is kind of to keep this uh, uh, moment alive, the moment of all possibilities, that sometimes it is important to, to taste it, to taste a bit of emancipation in order to, to keep on fighting. Thank you. Done from Blokada and from Zagreb as a model. Uh -huh. but like that. Really? Here in, 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 in Ubede, yeah. yeah. It spreads. And, and it had the, this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, do we have, yeah, so th this was my job here to present you these cases. As I said, not all are there. They are different, they, they, they have different messages. Uh, but speak about possibilities and limits of artistic, of artistic interventions. And of course, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts, comments, criticism, and questions. I would shortly comment uh, on mm -hmm. your last, uh, last conclusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to say also that I am My very proud. Speak up. That I am very proud to be part of all of these uh, struggles that, was, that were happening in Zagreb. So both Blokada and Varsavska and Kominyaci. And uh, I have to say that although it, it might seem that things got back to the, to the business, that it's business as usual, I would say that nothing was the sa nothing was same again after these struggles. Um, okay, <coughs> the education is being commercialized. The um, the shopping mall that we fought against uh, is there standing. Uh, the Ministry of Culture, well. We don't have a fascist for a minister anymore, but the <laughs> Ministry of Culture is still not doing the, the, the job as we would uh, want it to be. But on the <coughs> other hand, the way how uh, people talk about public space in Zagreb, the people, how people talk about culture, uh, or how they talk about education, is so drastically changed um, that, that it is like it shifted completely. When you speak about public space in Zagreb, uh, people are, s I mean, people, not only us who were, who were there, not only people from our circle, uh, but when you mention public space, people are so empowered uh, to act, and there, there are many small struggles, completely not connected to us, happening on a um, uh, uh, municipal or neighborhood level, people fighting for their parks, for the better infrastructure, uh, in a way, understanding that it's up to them to uh, come together, to organize, and to fight for. Uh, so I think that things are not changing on the on the level of the 
uh, of the politics or policy, but I think that what, what you are mentioning, this, this sense of um, liberation and emancipation mm -hmm. is something that you remember for a long time and that keeps you going uh, into new struggles. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something very valuable that we get from, uh, uh, from these moments of being together. I, I have to make a, I would like to make a reflection, uh, which is also a, 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 like a symptom, maybe the typical examples that you have shown of some kind of struggle that are uh, happening in the uh, sphere of uh, representation, in a symbolic, in the, the, the they are not uh, like entering the, ha the way how the, they are not operative, not uh, in, uh, uh, not interfering in the way how like society is produced, how it's uh, working, not entering the social relations, but they operate only in a representative field. So where we also place the field of culture normally, but I don't think it has to be like this because also art and culture are produced and there are certain, uh, uh, relations of its production and it's never perceived like this so we have to uh, look at the culture and art as a work that is produced and it has its uh, as any other work and it also symptomatic that uh, it's happening in the uh, politic intele uh, cultural uh, institutional uh, university spheres which are like normally uh, all the cases are like the like higher uh, interfe uh, uh, are uh, happening a uh, concern like how to say like middle and higher classes they are not only the one Except example the with the course but yeah, it's also I would say because I know them I know the work so they are coming as artists to do some work uh, with the uh, in the context of uh, work uh, of a workers collective. And uh, there is actually not much interference uh, with this art, this mural doesn't come from uh, uh, workers, but it somehow uh, artists come to uh, instruct a little bit the, you know, there is this uh, relation we have to say, I mean, uh, in the, uh, if you look the production, the, from the side of the production, how the artists produce mm -hmm. this artwork. And, uh, and I think there is actually some uh, more, in and all these uh, like protests, they, they're not uh, genuinely coming from a Yugoslav, they're like part of bigger uh, like uh, social movements and uh, this uh, spectacularity and uh, performativity is part of uh, like other uh, pro protests and movements, something that is very easily we know like uh, appropriated from the like capitalist uh, way of, you know, like this uh, model, so. But uh, there is some other uh, movement that I think is maybe more interesting. I mean, in the meanwhile, there is uh, lots of protests in this area in Serbia, you know, coming from the workers' protests, and it would be interesting to look at this, like what is the culture, what is the art, what is the way of doing when it's more coming from the uh, uh, workers' um, movement side, and also, uh, in the terms of the culture that it produces, and uh, and also, uh, sorry, just I want to say about the housing movement that is super interesting because it's the direct, action, very like uh, uh, having lots of uh, force now, taking lots of force. A very interesting movement, uh, which is uh, going throughout uh, uh, Belgrade, mainly Serbia. I don't know if also in other parts of former Yugoslavia, but uh, with uh, where there is this. Uh, really collaboration with the uh, lower classes that are affected and it's based on like a, a, a direct action that I think it's important because it's uh, like very concrete uh, actions in, involved. It's not just a representative, it has like a real effects, like in uh, like defending and solidarity with uh, like s certain people which are uh, like belonging to different kind uh, classes. But this was very short. Which is the um, I just wanted to say shortly that uh, at least uh, in Croatia or Zagreb, out of which <coughs> I think all Croatian examples uh, were taken, 
um, this whole process of uh, empowering not only uh, intellectuals or artists or cultural workers, but under exclamation marks, uh, ordinary people, has only uh, just begun. And I think that although there is definitely uh, an influence in this area from this uh, movement uh, from the last 10 years, I think it will pass some more substantial time before uh, this uh, grassroots activism by citizens can really alter the decision-making process on the institutional level. And right now, uh, Zagreb is also facing a similar threat uh, as uh, Belgrade. As uh, this uh, corrupted mayor, now 20 years in power, uh, has begun to collaborate with the uh, uh, same uh, company from uh, Arab Emirates, Eagle Hills, in order to uh, do a similar thing in Croatia. And uh, it will be interesting to see if. Uh, this uh, grassroots uh, left-wing uh, politics, which uh, uh, different from Belgrade, did won a certain uh, amount of uh, delegates in the city council, will be strong or influential enough to to block to block this thing, and then uh, again to really empower uh, citizens when it comes to daily daily decision making about this public space uh, so many people intentionally care about. I just wanted to say um, thank you for this because uh, uh, for me it was really emotional. Uh, I've, um, here there was like this, the same kind of history. We started the occupation with the Zagreb model in, uh, uh, in, in our heads. We put the Blockada documentary to start the occupation. We were not allowed because they knew about it and we did it one uh, week later. Uh, our occupation was uh, re uh, a reoccupation of something that was one year before and did not really make it and did not have any force and we said we will do it next year with more force and um, like the topics the things are <laughs> almost like the same the the way it's spilled into the society is the same the inclusion from not from that not only from that moment but from that moment on um, this kind of uh, where I also see it is uh, towards the public space uh, there were some fights for the public space the most notable one was with City Hall trying to make a new lane uh, and to like cover the so much the river area and to put a new uh, car lane and the people fought against that and to not happen and the city hall uh, renounced that plan that was like a huge win for uh, people who wanted uh, a common greener nicer city and um, the reference with uh, <laughs> Tatro Valo, like a lot of things uh, circulated in this uh, in this um, area in the mm. Balkans, let's say mm. or whatever, and that was uh, really cool. But I was um, curious uh, about um, uh, what she said uh, with this more kind of representational work or not. Uh, I. We, for example, tried very hard not only to get involved, uh, obviously our plenaries got together everybody, they were open to everybody, but they were not uh, target, we did not target only the teachers in the university, we target what we call the TESA, which is like the auxiliary personnel in the university, the cleaning ladies, the people who uh, are guards, whatever. And uh, we also tried to make contact with the union of the TESA workers and we c called them at the plenary to make like this huge working class student. students. And workers. Yes, but what yeah. happened is like the union guy came so drunk that he was not allowed to come into the university. So that was the failure of the <laughs> student the workers uh, solidarity in that moment. So yeah, I was curious if this uh, happened also in, uh, in Zagreb because yeah, I'm just uh, maybe just a, just a short comment on, on all, all, all questions. <coughs> of course, here I focused on art, artistic products yeah, of that uh, 
Therefore, therefore, this does not cover all struggles. There's a lot of struggles happening where, let's say, artists do not play such an important role or the artistic play with this activist aesthetics is not that present. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it is, uh, 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 what is interesting is that there is an enormous cultural production around these issues, around these left-wing progressive struggles <laughs> and with problems attached to it. Right? <laughs> problems are that this is not only nice and great and, and fantastic. It, it, there, there are problems related to political struggle. Wh when you levitate between aestheticization and making an interesting cultural products for the market, yeah, for other people, and supporting the movements that are there. So it <laughs> is, it's not an easy thing. And uh, 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 what Reshape does, I think that corresponds fully to this ambiguous position of artists within a social movement. Second thing is, uh, of course, activist aesthetics is not only uh, aesthetics of nice, beautiful, progressive, left-wing people. The right-wing has also aesthetics. And they have their aesthetics of protest, of organization, of movement. It's, it's enough just to look at, uh, at the Italian neo-fascist movement that does exactly what we do, occupy uh, public spaces, opening up for people, handing out food, opening up boxing centers, place to hang around, and then you do occasionally a little fascist march through Rome. What else you could do in Rome than that? And that's how you socialize people. And they've been run, Casa Pound, I'm talking about Casa Pound, uh, they've been run by a former metal singer, very cool guy, you know, for a lot of people. Uh, and also, in Croatia, this kind of anti-eviction movement was started by the right wing because we failed to do it. So really? they just enter into, the, into that space. Luckily, in Belgrade, this is not the case. It's mostly left-wingers. But they just enter into the empty space. But who gets evicted? People get evicted because they, do, they don't pay loans. And the people are like, uh, kicked out for not paying one loan or two loans. Ah, so they're not Roma people. Um, they could, but it's not only Roma people, it's just like <laughs> everyone else in these societies that of course had to get a loan to buy a flat and so on. So the, 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 <laughs> this space was occupied in Croatia by right-wingers who then enter into parliament, are quite popular because they fight for the people. Of course the right-winger is going to reappropriate our language. They are not stupid. Our problem is that very often we can't go a step further we have discussions about political organizations. We don't want to be part of organizations that do not correspond to our ideals. Um, and then there are various problems with that. And also we live in a hostile environment where the space for such progressive movements is very limited. And in, in many spaces, in many places, what, what Mariana just said, it, it is entirely true that this encouraged so many people to step out to now talk about public space, about commons, without being afraid of being accused of socialism or, or, or being accused of you being, as we call, you nostalgic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for 30 years, people, you know, couldn't speak up their mind, being afraid to be accused of being commies, you know? So the left is only now coming back, and it has to be the 21st century left, clearly, but it also, is the left that will certainly, especially in the former Yugoslav area, will have to look back in, in 20th century. And now, now just to, to give a bit of historical difference with the places uh, like Czech Republic, Romania, Romania, Poland, and so on, there is a certain heritage that cannot be just brushed aside as dictatorship or totalitarianism or something like that. There's a heritage of anti-fascist struggle which is still relevant. There's a heritage of self-management as a system. Only in Yugoslavia it existed as such, where literally there was something called social ownership, so people own their factories. If we want to make a different uh, uh, economic system, we'll have to democratize the workplace. And then we're going to go back to the models that have been already tried. In Yugoslavia it was tried at the state level for 30 years. And that system presided over the modernization of the country. So of course you're going to go back again to this. There's all also the non-alignment movement that was led by 
by Yugoslavia, Egypt, India, and other countries, that again is becoming a very important in the, in the new world war we are actually facing now. But just the question is how, when we're going to declare it as a world war. I mean, what's happening in the Middle East, it is a world war. But it's not happening to us. So that there is a way between various powers of organizing and the, the networks of solidarity that used to exist during the non-aligned movement period. So there's a lot of things you have to think again, re-evaluate uh, uh, what was your, your past and your heritage. Of course, without, uh, uh, not with idealization only of the ideals, but also to re-evaluate the reality of these regimes that were not always as nice and rosy as we tend to believe or uh, on the left. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, I was um, giving a lecture in, in, in Ljubljana and I, I dare to say that Yugoslavia was the most successful socialist project of the 20th century. Here it is, oh, up there. No, Romania. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, you see, uh, maybe you'll start competing. <laughs> Maybe it was. Maybe it was. And then, of course, one Baduan, Baduan uh, philosopher came and said, no, 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 we cannot, but you said, all right, but you said, that everything was a disaster. Everything was a disaster. Forget about 20th century, 19th century, only the future. Only the future. <coughs> Let's just go to the future. I said, okay, if Badiou said so. But if you want to do things in this world, lowering inequalities, democratizing politics, democratizing workplace, you want to reshape international relations, you'll have to go back to this heritage. You'll have to rethink it. It's not a clean slate. Um, and all of these contradictions of this process, and even a frustration of this process, with all this difficult heritage we have, heritage of the failed socialism, heritage of failed Yugoslavia, heritage of the series of wars with 130,000 dead people and 10,000 still missing, is something that is put on the shoulder of an entirely new left movement. And of course, it's sometimes it's very difficult to, to, to bear this weight. <coughs> Thank you, Igor. It's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely love what you've been saying. Uh, I want to just touch upon your reference to kind of this historical cleansing, mm -hmm. and most physically of the statues. And uh, yeah, where we, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, we're just doing the historical cleansing, and wherever we live in the world, generally there are statues, and we normally say, "Who is he?" Because it's generally is a he. <laughs> um, and very few statues to women anywhere, other than religious figures. Um, and it, it, it's, it, I live on a tiny island called Great Britain that's slowly <laughs> drifting as we speak closer and closer physically to the States. We're going out into the Atlantic, unfortunately. Um, and we have our own conversations there about statues, particularly around those related to slavery, um, as, as in the United States. And, um, but, but here, a very short story. Sheila, uh, uh, to my left here, uh, just two or three years ago, working uh, with a group of really courageous and passionate um, change makers working in arts, culture, creativity mm. in Sofia. And uh, you may know it, there's a, a kind of graveyard for all the uh, communist era statues in Sofia, um, a little bit out of the city center, and a museum of communist art. And um, it's fascinating, and they were saying that most of these um, sculptures, which are a large number by women, all trained in Moscow, returning but having a very Bulgarian um, language mm -hmm. um, and so as outsiders who haven't been through this experience it was absolutely extraordinary to experience um, and then we going back to the people we were working with who are largely in their 20s and in their own 30s we asked had you ever been there and there's almost a physical kind of shudder saying we will never go there um, mm -hmm. we you know we couldn't imagine it so there's this, uh, having gone through this period of privatization of the communist star going on, the big M for McDonald's going up, people were turning their back on what was a really rich 
story. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm just interested to know whether you think they should be removed or how, if they are still there <coughs> and are seen as oppressive, you might begin to see them as a valuable part of a conversation about where we've been and where we might go to. Because they're everywhere in our cities that represent all the winners in our society and the oppressors. But you're suggesting, I think, something else. And it was really interesting as an outsider to the story. You are getting to something extraordinarily important, uh, not only for this art, but actually for narratives political communities speak about themselves and what is the dominant narrative, what is silence narrative, what you can say, what you cannot say. Uh, uh, symbolic violence that happened to us after the fall of socialism is enormous and it affected all spheres of life, including language. Right? What words do you use? How do you approach things? What you can say, what you cannot say? For at least 20 years, until the crisis of 2008, we were silenced. We were in a little ghetto where, you know, we would read interesting books. The only one who managed to get out of this was Slavoj Žižek. And basically uh, having this kind of uh, a possibility to say things uh, that other people cannot say. Um, but in public discourse, it was almost impossible. And what happened to people, and this is still not understood in, in a lot of parts of Eastern Europe, it's when your life has a cutting point that devaluates completely, delegitimized your entire life before. And that's enormous violence. The way how to deal with that for people was simply not to talk about it. Yeah? Uh, not to talk about the fact that they actually lived. Okay? People live under various regimes. Some are not nice. Many socialist regimes were not nice in many periods of their existence. But that's another story. The story of people is that, you know, people did fall in love, they did make love. Now the book is out that actually sex was better under socialism. <laughs> the, the answer is simple. People had more time. Exactly. Yes. And so, we were younger back then. And we were younger back then, you know, but now it's, it, there is something in that. And uh, the problem was that, of course, this did not only affect, and I, I, I want to underline now what I'm going to say. This did not only had consequences in the East. The fall of Berlin Wall and the fall of socialism happened to the West as well. It's a little known fact that affected the West enormously and turned into the destruction of social protections and social welfare. It was the end of an era. So it didn't happen only to us. Actually, for us in Yugoslavia, it didn't happen at all. We could travel freely, so we didn't care. It was very nice to see the, the wall gone because it was we were seen as a barbaric thing that Soviets do, but it didn't happen to us. Well, what, what is that for us? But actually it did happen to us because of the domino effect that happened after that. And it actually fell on our heads. Yeah? So you have a lot of untold stories of kind of, yes, people did live and did progress under socialism, and also some people suffered under socialism. That's absolutely true. Uh, that people... Uh, that then some other people suffer immediately after this glorious end of socialism, which is us in the former Yugoslavia, the war that happened in the heart of Europe. But it was easy to do a cordon sanitaire and the media cordon around it and simply say, we don't want to look at that. Huh? We don't want to look at that. The fact that an hour from, you know, hour and a half from Paris, things are happening that are absolutely barbaric, absolutely barbaric. Uh, that is, is something we, we still did, did, haven't discussed. Uh, and then we are thrown into this world, which is, which is being completely modeled according to neo neoliberal agenda, in which we have to find some kind of answers to the current situation, and nobody has it. Nobody has it. And there, there we see this confusion and contradictions that are part of who we are. This is, this is where we live. It's a contradictory system. We are all contradictory to ourselves, to the life we live. This is what capitalism is. And then you can, you can have the various strategies of coping, coping with that situation. But that you can go off the grid, that you can escape it, that you can kind of uh, do some moral gestures that will make you feel good, well, that won't change anything. Again, it's already calculated. 
Yeah? We were talking about carbon footprinting. Now there's a whole economy based on the fact that people will travel less, of course. And there is no way out of that by moral gestures. And this is where we are getting to this point, which I think is dramatic. Uh, regardless of the current wave of protests that are inspiring, but not so inspiring such as in Bolivia, but inspiring in Lebanon or Iraq or Chile, uh, where the, the, the defeat of, of European left was confirmed at the last European elections, uh, where this cycle of 10 years uh, uh, ended uh, in, um, in a rather unfavorable position of what we call the left. Uh, that, uh, that shift that was happening during these 10 years towards a more radical left is over. The shift towards the mainstream is there with a bit of green things. Uh, the, the fact that the left also went back into identity politics fully, which of course has to be, be there. It is a part of the struggle of the left to fight for the oppressed, yeah? to fight against patriarchy, to fight against the oppression of marginalized communities, uh, be it by race or ethnicity, it's part, it's the DNA of the left. But curiously, the class kind of is now again out of fashion. And uh, 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 this is where we're going to face uh, uh, a lot of problems into constructing the left for the 21st century that could effectively, effectively make some change. And the question is whether we are ready to, to engage into, into these type of struggles that is not nice. It's not nice. Put any one of us in the position to govern and you're going to face a lot of moral problems. And then you're going to face an ugly world out there. And we don't want to do it. We want to be writers and artists and intellectuals. We want someone else to do the job for us. We can criticize. And, and of analysis. course we can criticize and say, oh, you sold out to the system and I'm still great and so on. But please get me that grant so that I could go and meet my friends and continue criticizing <laughs> the system and so on. <laughs> so this is our, we have to accept it. This is our contradiction. I mean, we are all part of that and then see how we could actually work around it. Do you think that part of the use playing now is because uh, it's more connected with the action? Yes, yes. I mean, actuation is, is, is an important, of course, it's, it's a also a theoretical debate, but it's also something about how do we change? Yeah? So we think about action, but actually, how do we change? My hope is in what I mentioned, these examples of actuation of emancipation, that, that it's not, it does matter what, is, what kind of process is that. Yeah? It's not the crude action getting to that point. Because if it's crude action, then we need a serious revolutionary organization, hierarchical, that does the things, that uses violence, because without that it doesn't work, that other people are going to use violence against you, so you want to win or not. And you might lose your soul in the process, but that's what revolutions used to be, that we often invoke in our thinking and imagining. I think also is uh, identity politics, uh, where left is uh, nowadays based somehow. I think it's uh, uh, identity politics came to replace the class, like a uh, order. So when this is moved now, like uh, it's logically that uh, also the left being placed in identity politics is completely lost its uh, possibility since, since of activity. Uh, this the is the, the process, of course, but we have just to have a notion that really identity politics came to replace the class uh, under understanding uh, 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 the class structure system. So, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> as in as a part of the neoliberal uh, agenda. And also, just to mention uh, the European resolution of uh, uh, totalitarian totalitarianism, where in the 90s first the proposal was made, uh, I think 96, from the European uh, Parliament to equal the uh, victims. Of, of, like, there was first a concern how to deal with the uh, uh, heritage communist. Uh, 
heritage of it, it, right now when uh, lots of uh, Eastern European countries uh, are entering the uh, Euro European Union and uh, well then after it was a bit uh, left in, in, inside but then when the protests started uh, around the big crisis in 2008 when the protests started there was a Prague declaration of uh, European Parliament uh, then now uh, bringing this resolution about uh, equaling the victims uh, of uh, totalitarian regimes, like equaling the Nazis uh, oh, victims from the Second World but War. Not the victims, the regimes. <laughs> Sorry? They were equating the regimes, not the, vic the victims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, no, no, no. It w it's exactly the, uh, related to the victims of the regimes. But look, the, the declaration, the Prague Declaration uh, from 2008. And, uh, <coughs> and the victims of Nazism with the victims <coughs> of uh, communism, but now like the communism was a new like thing. Like after 40 years, there was this uh, like urge to like uh, condemn uh, the uh, communists. And then the effect of this at that particular moment was to disqualif disqualify the left the movement that were like rising at the time in Greece, in uh, like a, a lot of South European uh, uh, countries, Spain and so on. So this was uh, like a political tool to uh, disqualify socialism as a progressive uh, uh, like a, a movement. Uh, uh, there's one question there. So, um, we have I, I want to share a reflection with you and uh, I'm so tired so I'll try to be clear and my aim of sharing is to know if how you see it not if you agree or not but do you see problematic uh, perspective to it and it's about the aesthetic perspective more than the activism perspective in what you've been presenting and I come from the region where you described it living a world war and I totally agree. <coughs> um, I, I think the aesthetic question between east, west, south, north, na 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 does not apply only in theaters but al also in activism and it affects a lot the, the level of solidarity that we as activists and there is a term in the region called archivist. I don't know yeah. like but we use it a lot. Uh, to combine artists and activists. Um, I think that uh, the standards of aesthetic affects a lot the solidarity that we live globally. And here I, I refer to the Lebanese revolution, for example. It's very easy for us as a group here, I think, to communicate and to sense the aesthetic of what's happening in the streets of Beirut. But it's not that easy to connect with what's happening in Sudan, so, uh, for example, or what happened in Syria before. And I think we need to challenge ourselves a little bit in that area and to, to try to accept the diversity of aesthetics mm -hmm. that we ask for in theaters and movie theaters, although also in streets and in activity. As you say, it's not a matter of agreeing or, or not agreeing. It, it, it is like that. It's true that we could connect, of course, with the, with the Lebanese because they look like everybody else, uh, and uh, and it's uh, and uh, they speak like anybody else. Perfect English, perfect French, uh, perfectly educated. Oh my God! So it's uh, then you connect easily then with Sudan and. Uh, Standing, standing on top exactly. and making so, so a gesture yeah. to make it an icon Absolutely. to connect to the revolution. Absolutely. Other than that, no. Other than that, because that enter into our iconography, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, which very often you have interesting. And some people already wrote about it: the protest and the figure of of, of women, such as in Ga Gezi Park protest <laughs> and so on, or in Macedonian protest that women that were doing yeah. the lipstick thing. And mm -hmm. there's already the okay. entire. People love it, media love it. They love to explore this. Uh, the problem is in, in, in more difficult cases. Like I think there, there are cases where we know what is our side. Yeah? We know on what side. <coughs> what happens in the cases such as uh, Maidan in mm -hmm. Ukraine, 
you know, what happens in the case, even now with what's happening in Bolivia, it's like mm -hmm. a lot of different voices coming. Uh, what's, what's, what happened in Syria after, after, uh, after all, uh, uh, where people are looking for a pure moment, which is the beginning of Syrian revolution, and then it wasn't pure any longer, so people didn't want to look at this. Uh, and also our fascinations with, 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 with certain places. Uh, I talked with many Greek friends, we were absolutely thrilled with Syriza. Syriza was the hope. I mean, after all, Tsipras was there in this film. And then there was a disappointment. And the, the thing is that many, many uh, people just turn to another cool thing, Corbyn, you know. Then there will be another cool thing somewhere else, especially if, if you know, the, the message is good. And then we forget about it. People forgot about this, you know. They, they don't follow what happened after that. Because that was the moment when you expected someone else to do the job of your dreams, huh? to create a place that would be perfect and by the seaside. <laughs> that, was, that was powerful. And then suddenly, pop. N none of this. Funny thing, I, when I ask, and, and I'll, I'll stop with that unless there are, there are other comments, uh, when I ask a friend, so I was there in 2015 and we were all crazy, uh, and then 2016, depression. So I asked him, so, so what happened? And he said, well, you know, <coughs> For Tsipras, we thought he was Antigone, but he turned out to be a Creole. <laughs> of course, typical Greek way. <laughs> the situation, Antigone. But there's something in that. We would all like Antigones, but there, there, there's also so someone has to be a Creole, or when you come to power, you get to be Creole, you get to rule, and that's not that nice. And the question is, what can you do? and what you betray, what you cement, and what will be the legacy of a failed, failed attempt at the democratic kind of change. Uh, and unfortunately, that legacy for all of us is demoralized. But maybe not to, to stop on this demoralizing <laughs> note, um, I try to show you a lot of examples of people really struggling under very difficult condition, very difficult condition, it really is difficult to develop a progressive, let's call it socialist politics, in the post-socialist space. Extraordinarily difficult, and it will be difficult for many, for many years to come, and then maybe at one point uh, people will feel liberated and, and simply say, no, we want this type of society, and we want to build it differently than the one we have now, which, of course, many of us perceive as unjust. One more question. For I would have a question. Uh, in all those uh, initiatives, they sort of uh, created some margins, mm -hmm. marginal spaces, marginal way of thinking, and marginal. And all those margins were invested in order to fight the center. And I was wondering about the initiatives making and creating some margins just for the sake of the margin. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, being trying to get a community somewhere, not out of the system because it's not possible, but just as far as possible from the system. Is it useless? Are we playing the role of the system not fighting against it? Because each time we make a big demonstration, and when our demonstration is failing in attempting, uh, we give some more power to the center. And that's what happened in France. There had, there's been, at the moment, there were a lot of people demonstrating, and uh, the government didn't say, uh, didn't accept it to change what they had tried to implement. And this was said to be the moment when the power understood that, in fact, even if people demonstrate, they don't have to change. So, in fact, those movements have given more power to the centers. And because there are some people trying to make some communities in the Carpats, or I've heard of people, and mm -hmm. what do you think about this kind, this kind of uh, aesthetics, community aesthetics? I, I have to say, of course, it's, it's never useless. Yeah. It's never useless, and, 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 and people should keep on doing this, but after a while, after years, you get, <laughs> you get a bit of a burnout. Yeah. And sometimes it's, you ask yourself, is it worth all this energy? Uh, I think Yellow West movement brought all the contradictions of the anti-systemic movement, 
the enemy is not stupid. You know? <laughs> it might be less artistic, less cool, less charming, but it's not stupid. So basically, what they they go, they anyhow they gave us culture to play with a little bit, and they kept the money. You know? so they know what they are doing, and they knew what they were doing even in 1968 when million people were on million people were on the street. Um, some people, of course, fed up with everything. We decide to make communes and just simply step out of everything and be surrounded by people they want to see. And it's been some wonderful experiments like that. And we need these spaces. Call them safe spaces for our politics. But they are marginal. And they're going to remain marginal. Uh, what we all hope for are some concrete changes. After all, radical left being reduced to social democratic politics. True radical left. What we want is a welfare state. Mm -hmm. No one on the radical left is saying we want to destroy capitalism completely as a system and then build something else, or in some very marginal, marginal places, and this is a rhetoric, nothing else. We all want welfare state. So this is how less radical we are than people in Italy in the 70s or in, in the 60s, not to mention before the revolutionaries that really wanted to make a big shift. And for this, we need concrete decisions. Someone has to take power and bring laws into place, and, and and we need something which is not that sexy, which is a budget redistribution. <laughs> That's definitely not sexy. And the system might figure out that, you know, with a bit of money that they're going to give for culture and education and so on, they might get to the position of the US where universities are playgrounds for the leftists. So go there and say whatever you want. And you can say it. You can say it to the students. Who are you paying. get a lot of money for it. You get a lot of money for that. They are paying for that to listen how the system is bad. Okay, that's good. That's a good deal for everyone. Yeah? And everyone's clean. And all, nobody can do, can do absolutely anything. But again, not to get into this bit of cynical position that nothing could be done. I think things could be done. And, and at least it's worth doing them for the sake maybe of our personal change. Uh, no. That's it. We can not go anymore. You know, Warren Buffett said that there is class war and we are winning. <laughs> 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 we are crushing it. Like the other side doesn't even accept there is class war. They're deep. Is it a class war? Class war? Don't, don't, use the, okay. don't use the term because it's very it's bad. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. <laughs> Thank you.